Um, so we welcome you to our uh, Cabin Hill United Ministries uh, monthly conversations. And um, our theme this year is that about reclaiming. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, in a bit. But as you, most of you know that uh, Capitol Hill United Ministries is uh, a, a, a group that's been together for over 35 years. And our purpose is collegiality, bringing uh, congregations and uh, nonprofits together. There's Chris. Hi, Chris. Um, and working with agencies in our community that are caring about those that are in need. It's also about advocacy and how we help our brothers and sisters who are marginalized, about being a spiritual presence in the community and uh, being a place of education. And for the last nine years, as most of you know, because you've been involved with it, we have um, provided overnight shelter uh, and hospitality for women who are experiencing homelessness. Uh, we did it every night for nine years and now we closed a year ago, it's been a year ago this month. Uh, because of COVID, and we're hoping we could we're hoping we can reopen in uh, August. Um, as you know, it's dependent on whether or not I can raise one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to pay for overnight staff. Our staff has always been volunteer, so we'll see how that goes. Um, and then during this year, we've been very involved. Uh, we've um, provided over seventy tons of supplies for twelve agencies that are working with people that are experiencing homelessness providing lunches, thousands of lunches um, every day for, um, I think it's eight different agencies. And we're also focusing on the issue of nonviolence. We're in our third um, program of nonviolence that we are working with, a seven week program that has been absolutely uh, amazing in the stuff that we're reading and the conversations we're having. Some of you that are on, uh, I see your wonderful faces, are part of our conversation on nonviolence. And then in terms of reclaiming, it's uh, we've been through an interesting four, four years, four or five years. And we feel that there's been a sense of loss of our concepts and ownership to words that we thought we understood. And um, we're looking at having different conversations as we go through the year on um, the issue of reclaiming values and science and truth and uh, the press, um, reclaiming the earth, and our humanity. And along with that, one of the issues is uh, reclaiming in terms of what the political system can be in the best of its, its creation. And with that, we have uh, Senator Chris Hansen, uh, who we're so pleased. Hi, Chris, again. And you can unmute yourself if you'd like, because uh, then it's gonna be all yours in a bit. Um, but Senator Chris Hansen has been a friend of Chum and we've had a number of conversations with him. Um, and um, we only have a few questions for him, not, not, not really strong ones, just looking at the issue of voting rights and taking care of the earth and media, um, you know, nothing really important. <laughs> um, and we also will have joining us is uh, Jorge Montiel, who will be joining us uh, at 1.30. And, and Chris, I, you know, I always like looking at your bio. I'm really sad you didn't have a good education. I'm sure you've all read his bio in terms of um, getting a degree in nuclear engineering. And can you explain what BS little c means? Oh, it's just short for Bachelor of Science as opposed oh. to a, a BA, it's a BSC. Oh, so. well, I have one too, and I didn't know that. Yeah. <laughs> oh, who knew, okay. Um, and uh, diplo graduate diploma in civil engineering. Um, Master of Science in Engineering Systems for MIT, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, so sorry. <laughs> yeah, my, my dad uh, was asking me at one point, are you gonna get a real job someday? I was like, well, I just really love reading books, dad. I'll just stay in grad school as long as I can. Well, now that you're in the, in the state Senate, are you really gonna get a good job one of these days? <laughs> well, I've gotten the same question for my kids. Like, dad, can you please get a real job? Um, they're, they're very confused by me, you know, working 60, 70 hours a week. And uh, this is just a part-time job, so. Yeah. Well, I, we really welcome you. Um, I honor the work that you do and the great conversations we've had in the past. And I'm basically gonna turn it over to you and. Um, you know, share in terms of what your, um, why you're coming on with us and um, things that you can share. And also, I think if the, after you, hold on a second here. 
after you do the, um, you know, any kind of presentation you want to give, um, I, I would like you to talk about one of the first things, which I know is in your Ballywick in, in particular, is about our carbon reduction goals and, and what you can tell us in terms of caring for the earth and reclaiming the earth. Uh, I was going to introduce uh, Sonia. And Sonia, would you like to talk about how we're going to work out questions and all that? Sure, I think um, most of you are very familiar with this, but we'll let Senator Hansen speak and uh, Mr. Montiel, and then at the end, um, you will be invited. I think we're a small enough group that you can either use the raise hand feature in reactions to know, alert us that you want to ask a question. You can put a question in the chat or just unmute yourself and get our attention at that point. Thanks, Diana. Thank, thank you. Okay, Chris, now it's yours. All right. Well, terrific. I, yeah. It's so great to, to be back with you. I, unfortunately, virtually, uh, I've so much enjoyed uh, getting to know many of you face to face and, and in person over the over the years. Uh, I guess I'm I'm sort of at the midpoint of my fifth year uh, in the legislature, and had the pleasure of uh, representing House District Six for three years, and then uh, went over to the Senate last January, and then and then ran for a full term this last election, and uh, do a lot of work. Uh, on joint budget committee. That's kind of my, uh, this is our busy week this week. We are uh, rapidly spending your taxpayer money, uh, about a billion dollars a day on average, uh, which I say sort of half joking. Uh, that's actually how the math works out because uh, we have about 30 days to set the budget uh, in the final analysis. And uh, the budget is about $33 billion. So uh, yeah, we got just a quick, quick math and it's about a billion dollars a day of, that we're that we're appropriating uh, on your behalf. And you know, just a quick comment on that because I, I really see budgets as moral documents. Uh, many of you have maybe heard me say this before. Uh, they are a reflection of our moral priorities. Uh, budgets um, are um, really, what, what is it we hold up and value and, and how does that reflect um, you know, our highest priorities? And we're trying really hard in this budget uh, um, in particular, it's always the case, but especially as we're trying to come out of the COVID crisis, uh, helping families, helping people that are, are suffering. We know this is a very, uh, what economists would call K-shaped recovery. You've probably heard that phrase in the news. That just means the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer. That's what a K-shaped recovery looks like. And we are absolutely in the middle of a K-shaped recovery. Uh, Low-income families are still suffering tremendously, very high rates of unemployment still, lots of service sector jobs that have not recovered yet. Uh, we're certainly optimistic, but we're trying to shape a state budget that is very responsive to that moral imperative uh, and making sure we have a tax code that also is responsive to the situation. And I think what the federal government has done with the, the American uh, Rescue Act um, is, a, is, a, is a great, uh, lead for us to follow, uh, expanding EITC, the child care tax credits, direct aid to families who are at the lowest end of the income stream uh, and spectrum. Uh, we're, we're working on some very similar things in Colorado to reinforce um, making our, our economic system more uh, fair and giving those families a chance to recover quickly uh, that need, it, need the help the most. So I'm very happy to, you know, during Q&A, if folks want to talk about budget and priorities, um, that's really top of mind for me right now as we're working on closing uh, the long bill. It's called the long bill because it's 600 pages long, uh, but it's basically uh, over a thousand line items, department by department. Uh, and we've been going through those uh, since the early part of November uh, on the Joint Budget Committee. It starts basically, you know, the day after the election. So that's the work I'm in involved in. And then I also chair um, the Senate Appropriations Committee uh, and so anytime, you know, any bill has any sort of appropriation that goes through Senate Appro Approves Committee. Uh, and so we're doing a lot of work, especially on the uh, stimulus package. The other big thing that, that, of course, you've seen in the news is that the state of Colorado is going to have uh, several billion dollars from the federal government to help uh, to the economy recover, to backfill places where we've lost revenue or lost funding. Um, and so this is a once in a lifetime, once in a uh, you know, ever opportunity for us to, to really uh, exercise those moral priorities in the way that we're allocating federal and state funds. And so that is, that is the work we're engaged in over the next uh, several months together. And I would love to hear from any of you anytime on things you think we should be prioritizing. I, I want to now kind of switch gears and go to the two topics that Diana helped um, tee up for us today, um, which is voter rights and voter access. Um, 
we are seeing uh, really, I would say unprecedented, but there's nothing new here. I mean, this is Jim Crow, like uh, 2.0 or 3.0 in the, the voter suppression laws that we are seeing filed around the country. Um, we saw them filed here. We have successfully stopped all of them in their first committee. Uh, this is one of the, uh, you know, I think huge differences between the Democrats and the Republicans right now, which is the Democrats have pushed uh, successfully in many states and, and now at the federal level to make sure we have, you know, easy access to the ballot for every single voter in this country, which seems like the most American thing I can think of. Uh, and unfortunately, it's become this massive uh, partisan battle. And so Republican state legislators, uh, Republicans in Congress are fighting things like HR1, are fighting uh, to increase the restrictions on people accessing the ballot um, and see what happened in the 2020 election as why they have to move quickly right now to do this. And it's awful. And what, what can we do in Colorado? Well, we can continue to be uh, the top system in the country. And so that everybody can point to it and say, Colorado, along with our you know, friends in Oregon and Washington and a few other places, have universal mail-in ballots. Everybody gets a mail ballot. Uh, and it's made a huge difference to voter access. It's made a huge difference to voter turnout, especially in low income and black and brown communities. And we've got to talk about that nonstop because we have to push back on these, these false narratives that have been pushed by the former president and been pushed by the Republican Party at the national and state level, and will fundamentally uh, alter, destroy, uh, are a cancer on our democracy. And we shouldn't mince words. If we are reducing voter access, we are uh, doing irreparable harm uh, to our country. And to me, it's that black and white. And I, I, uh, those of you that know me well, I don't really uh, go for hyperbole um, and try not to do that in my public speeches or my public remarks. Um, but I say this with the utmost urgency. Um, and so in Colorado, we have what is one of the top two or three voting systems in the country. We have great turnout. Uh, it's Minnesota and Colorado every single cycle for top turnout in primaries and general elections. And we've got to share that with the rest of the country and make sure that we don't have a rollback to, to Jim Crow types of uh, policies that are going to drastically reduce poll access for, for minority communities and, and low-income communities. Uh, it's urgent. It's the fate of our democracy. It is the foundational element of, of who we are as Americans. And if you haven't seen uh, Senator Warnock's speech on this last week, I highly recommend it. It was uh, the most powerful maiden speech, perhaps in the history of the U.S. Senate. Uh, it's easy to find on YouTube if, if you didn't catch it. Um, and this is what he spends about a half an hour uh, discussing. And it's particularly poignant for him as a black preacher, as uh, the new senator from Georgia, and of course, what just happened in Georgia in the last cycle, and how the state legislature there, controlled by Republicans, is now trying to eliminate early voting and uh, you know, you know mail-in voting access without uh, you know kind of direct excuses, et cetera. Um, massive rollback of voting rights in Georgia, and uh, we've all got to fight. We've all got to stand up right now and and do everything we can to to resist that. And of course, um, having a I think a really uh, you know, gold standard in Colorado or a, a national uh, leadership that we've shown in Colorado is, is part of how we do that. Um, so I'll, I'll pause on that one. I, uh, I'd love to talk more about that if folks have specific questions they want to get into. The good news is Colorado's in a great spot. The bad news is uh, 28 or 29 state legislatures right now are on the cusp of uh, rolling back voting rights across the country, uh, and it will do lasting damage to our democracy. Um, on the climate uh, an environmental topic, I wanted to start with a word that I think has always resonated with me and I'm guessing resonates with everyone on this call, which is the idea of stewardship. Um, I was raised in a, I guess, a, you know, a, a pretty conservative Methodist family in Western Kansas, um, had a lot of, of church involvement as I was growing up and into college. And, you know, that was a word that we heard a lot in Sunday school. Uh, it's a word we hear a lot on Sunday morning. And it's something that I think we have to remind everyone in, in all different parts of the faith community uh, to, to remember that word stewardship. And to me, this is fundamentally what environmental protection, what uh, battling climate change and, and uh, going aggressively after emission reductions in the state, that's what it's all about. 
Um, what are we going to pass on to our kids, our grandkids? What's going to be there for them? How are we stewarding the thing that was handed to us uh, by our parents, by our grandparents? Um, and we've got to work hard uh, to save that, to improve it, hopefully hand it off better than we found it, um, leave it better than we found it. Uh, and, you know, this is, this is the reason I left my job and ran for office. This is the place where I thought I could help the most. I could, could contribute my skills. Um, uh, you know, the, the, all those books I read in my 20s, you know, I could, I could do something useful with that. Um, take experiences from projects and work I've done uh, in around the world. Uh, lived in India for a while, Dubai, New Zealand. Uh, lived and worked in London and, and the UK for a long time. And in each spot, you know, learned something a little bit new and different uh, about environmental stewardship. And I, and I thought I could, could maybe bring some of that back to the Colorado legislature. And so I'm trying to approach this work, I suppose, uh, as an engineer and economist would, which is let's do as much as we can for as cheap as we can, as fast as we can. Um, that's essentially, I guess, my rubric. Um, but this is a crisis. This is something that is not gonna wait for us uh, it's something that we have to work hard on every day. It, it starts in our homes. Um, I hope you'll join me in never buying another internal combustion car ever again. Um, I certainly make that commitment, um, you know, trying to increase things like solar power and wind power. I've, you know, like many of you, I was able to put panels on my roof. Um, I'm trying to have as light a footprint as my family uh, can make on the earth. Um, and you know, are we all making mistakes in that front, but it starts at home. It starts with our personal choices. And then it rolls up to, again, the moral choices we're making at the state government level. And I've been running you know, five, six, seven bills a year on different aspects of emission reduction. Uh, this year, I've really focused in on the transmission power grid. Uh, I've focused in on the building materials that we use. How can we decarbonize the concrete and the steel and uh, the wood products that we put into our homes and office buildings and our roads and bridges. Um, how do we capture and destroy or mitigate the methane that leaks uh, all around the state? Um, agriculture sources, uh, closed down coal mines, uh, wastewater treatment plants. Um, if you ever wondered what happens when you flush the toilet, I'd be very happy to talk about that at length. Uh, if anybody has, hopefully everybody's finished their lunch at this point, but you know, these are super, uh, important things that we've got to tackle. And, and you know, most of, these, most of these bills, nobody really wants to talk about the power grid. Nobody really wants to talk about wastewater. Um, but these, I think, are places where we can make massive changes in, in our emissions. Um, and then there's the more obvious things like drive an EV instead of a gasoline car, um, you know, put insulation in your house and, and the things that we do at the personal level. But trying to bring that big puzzle together uh, has sort of been the focus of my academic and professional life. And now the reason that I quit my job and ran for office five years ago and uh, feel like so excited uh, to represent many of you uh, in the state Senate. So those are you know, the, the passions that, that, that brought me to this work, um, the kind of you know, the, the moral framework that I, I try to bring uh, to these difficult puzzles from tax policy to the budget to uh, climate change and lots of other issues, uh, you know, that, that of course come every year to the state legislature, uh, and just really am so glad to to spend time with Chum uh, to be able to talk with you on a regular basis. And let me just pause there and really just love to open up the conversation. And I know we're going to have Jorge joining us uh, shortly, who's a, another great mentor and friend for me as as I do this work. So does anyone have a question they would like to they would like to put out right now or another subject they would like to have discussed? Jean, you have to unmute. Hi. <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could tell us what's happening with um, Senate Bill 20-010. It's the one that is concerning the repeal of the prohibition of local government regulations of plastic? Oh, yes. Um, so, sorry, which number did you say? House Bill 1120? Um, I think it's Senate Bill 20 010. Okay, so Senate Bill 10. Um, so, yeah, so this is, 
um, a bill that's kind of focused on giving local government uh, the ability to, to make changes to, to their local regulations on the use of plastics. Um, and I'm just checking real quick. Uh, and Jesse, is that in committee right now? So Senate Bill 20, that proposal is postponed indefinitely, but they reintroduced new legislation this year for plastic pollution. Okay, so that bill, yeah, because that was last session, that one died, uh, you know, postponed indefinitely. And we've right. got a similar bill that's now come forward in the House. So you probably want to transfer your gaze onto, and we'll see if I can find the House bill number for you. Just give me a few minutes. I've got my amazing aide at the Capitol, uh, Jesse, is here with me. Uh, so I get to phone a friend if I need to. Uh, some of these details. So we'll get that number for you in just a second. Looks like it's 211162 um, is the House bill that covers the same subject. Uh, that bill is moving through the House. It has a lot of opposition, as you can guess. Um, but I think we will get a, a you know, an amended version of that in the Senate will probably be over uh, on our side of, of the Capitol in about two weeks would be my, my guess. There's uh, just to let you know, kind of procedurally what's happening right now is that any bills that have appropriations are basically sitting in House or Senate appropriations in the bill queue. So even if they made it out of the first committee of reference, so kind of, you know, like the business committee or the energy committee, transportation, et cetera, they have to wait until we can move things through appropriations, which now is a bit on ice until we get the long bill or the budget constructed. So we kind of take a bit of a pause figure out what the may overall budget situation is going to be, and then think about the individual bills that maybe have a new appropriation. So we've got to spend new money on them. Um, and so I have a feeling this bill is probably going to wait in the House until uh, we move that process forward. But that's a very normal thing. Every year, we kind of take a mid-session pause on bills that spend money uh, until we get the overall budget picture figured out. So that's kind of what's happening with that, that new bill that addresses plastic pollution. Um, but I have no doubt, you know, we will we will move forward with with a version of that bill. It's just not clear to me what amendments will come in the House. Thank you. I, I knew it had taken a pause there, but I I was I didn't yep. know that it had gotten sort of converted to the to the House bill. So um, thank you. Yeah, you're most welcome. Yeah, it's I, I tell you what, it's it can be opaque even when you're in the state Senate of like you know where is a bill right now. So. Always happy to try to help folks, uh, you know, follow areas of interest. So please drop me a line anytime. Maybe we could go to Margaret L. Next, she has a question on HR 1214. So Margaret, you can unmute and ask. And then after that, Peter and Allison Sautel have a question. Okay, uh, my name is Peggy Ulrich Nims. I live in your district, uh, Senator Hansen. And uh, I uh, there's a new bill that, uh, James Coleman has put forward with two other representatives, um, well, two other people. Weitzman is one and the other name is slipping my mind. But anyway, it has to do with sealing records for people, some of whom have don't even have convictions. They have arrests or charges or dismissed, but remain on their records. So I'm mostly putting in a good word for that, uh, those kinds of legal uh, justice um, reforms to help people whose uh, situations, housing and jobs and every other part of our social safety net system are usually closed off to them because yeah. they have, and I know we did a great thing with Ban the Box uh, session. So just want to put in a good word for that. Uh, should it make its way? It's in the Judiciary Committee right now, I believe, but no hearings have yet been scheduled. Yeah, I'm just checking that status myself. Um, uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. I That bill, I think, is in a very good position. I am very supportive of it. It has bipartisan support um, on, you know, kind of the leading folks on the Judiciary Committee in both chambers. Uh, so I think that will likely be to the governor's desk uh, in the next few weeks. So that's that's going to move. Uh, looks like very very rapidly, and and it's something I, I absolutely support. But I appreciate you bringing up that bill. It's it, I think, joins a, a, a long uh, relay race on this issue. Uh, we've passed several things like ban the box that you mentioned, 
we still have a lot more work to do. Um, you know, when people have served their time or they have served their sentences, uh, they need to have a pathway uh, to opportunity. And we've put a lot of barriers in people's way. Uh, and we are trying to steadily knock those down. And I think this bill uh, is definitely part of that effort. Thank you. I'll just add a quick thing. I'm a member of First Unitarian Society of Denver right here in this area. And we were working on a little project to try to help clear the records of people who never even were charged or where records were dismissed, but not sealed. Uh, but now we're kind of waiting on all of you guys to take the action of a much larger and grander sort, and then we'll see what's left for us to do. But very, uh, very happy to hear your uh, positive prognosis. So thanks so much. Bet. Peter All right, over Allison. to Peter and Allison. Yeah. yeah. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you for your good work and your good commitments. Uh, as a Christian minister who spent 20 years working with churches on environmental causes, I would suggest that stewardship may not be the best word for us these days, uh, although you have a deep interpretation of it. I've started talking about humans being called to be responsible members of the earth community instead of seeing ourselves sort of in charge of the community. But I'll have that conversation with you some other time. Uh, my question uh, dealing with your work on appropriations and budgets is the fossil fuel industries provide a huge amount of tax money to the state. And I'm sure that is an incentive to not hinder those industries. How do we deal with the state finances uh, while we're decarbonizing the industries of our state? And do just transitions for those who are impacted. Uh, yeah, I really appreciate this question. Um, this is something that I, I ran my very first bill in the House of Representatives in 2017 on this very issue. Uh, this was really top of mind for me as I, as I ran for office and then, and then began to serve. Um, I, I think this is a, a very complex uh, area and, and needs uh, you know, a lot more work. I'd say in Colorado, we are well ahead of the curve, though, when it comes to thinking about this. So let me first talk about uh, the fossil fuel industry's impact on state uh, revenue. It's actually surprisingly small. Uh, I know this kind of surprises people, but the state of Colorado, even in the very best years, meaning lots of production and high oil and gas prices, only brings in about $200 million in severance tax. Now, there are certainly knock-on effects, like if there's a lot of oil and gas activity, you get more sales tax and more income tax, and you know there are all, always those uh, secondary effects from the industry, but the direct taxation is actually very low for the state. Um, now, Weld County collects a lot of property tax from upstream oil and gas, um, but of course, that's directly related to the services they got to provide uh, around, those, around those industries, and so it you know, that nexus uh, is, is tighter from a county taxation standpoint. But all of that is to say that we, uh, Colorado, unlike say New Mexico or Wyoming, have a very small percent of our $33 billion budget coming directly from oil and gas. It's only a very small sliver, um, which means we don't have that same kind of dependency that you just mentioned. I mean, New Mexico and Wyoming are both 60% roughly of their state budgets come from extractive industries. Uh, for us, it's less than five. It's a very small sliver, depending on how you count it. Uh, it's less than 5% of the state economy. Whereas in Wyoming and New Mexico, it's you know, 30, 40, 50%, depending on how you count it. So we are, uh, in a sense, less beholden to some of those pressures compared to other states. Now, that doesn't take anything away from the other concept that you very rightly raised, which is how do we manage uh, what can be extremely dislocating and painful transitions. And I want to focus in on a bill that I started in 2017 that eventually passed in 2019 around funding transitions uh, around uh, closure of coal plants. Mm -hmm. So we passed that in 2019. We created a financing mechanism that would basically handle the stranded asset problem. So you've got this big power plant. What are you going to do with it? It still might be worth a billion dollars, like the one in Pueblo. Uh, Comanche 3 is what it's known as. Um, and it still has a very massive amount of value on the books, undepreciated uh, for the corporate finance people out there. And what do you do with that? And 
how do you, in that transition, help the workers and help the local communities that lose those jobs and tax base? So that's what we've created in um, Senate Bill 236 from 2019. We created a mechanism to do that. We set up a just transition office. We are now funding that. In fact, I've got a proposal this year that would get rid of severance tax breaks for fossil fuels and fund the just transition work. So you're basically using the remaining proceeds from those extractive industries as they, like in Cole's case, it is winding down in the state. It is winding down in the United States. It's actually winding down across the world as the Chinese and the Indians are canceling new coal units left and right. Uh, so that's you know good news. We've got a lot, lot to go there. But in Colorado, we now have that mechanism in place to fund that work. And so we are trying our best, as, as my dad would say, to skate to the puck. Like we know what's happening here. We know where things are headed. Let's prepare for it. Let's help those towns. Let's help those workers. And my hope is that, you know, five, six years from now, people will look at Colorado as sort of the, the gold standard on this, that we, we set it up in a good way. Uh, we, we thought ahead about the problem instead of waiting for a collapse and then trying to do something, which unfortunately is what happened in the Rust Belt. Uh, it's what has happened in Appalachia and arguably is what changed our politics in 2016. So, you know, the, that lesson is not lost on me. Uh, and that when you have people who feel uh, left out, left behind, disaffected, bad things result in our politics. And we need to be proactive about that. And I see the transition work squarely, uh, you know, on that target. Great. Thank you for the very helpful information and for your strong leadership. Great. We have three more questions in the chat. Maybe we can start with Molly. Um, go to Tom and follow that with Deb Bowling. So Molly has a question. Um, or if you are all anticipating better tax credits from the state or federal on EVs or PHEVs, given the Biden administration's win. Oh, okay. I'll try to be quicker because I want to. Has Jorge joined us yet? I don't want to. He just sure came he's... in. Yep. Oh, good. All right. Hi, I'll, Jorge. I'll be... Nice to see you. Hi, everybody. Welcome, sir. Thank you. Uh, I'll, I'll try to be really brief then. Um, so yes is the answer. I think we will see improved federal support for EVs during this administration. It can take on a bunch of different forms. Um, one of them, I think, is to get rid of the cap on the federal credit per manufacturer. Right now, it's the first 200,000 vehicles per manufacturer. Many of them are now reaching that. GM, Tesla are already there. Um, the other manufacturers, I think, will quickly hit it. And and therefore, I think there'll be political support to get rid of that and just allow any EV to claim that credit regardless of manufacturer. I think that would help. As far as the state of Colorado goes, we have an additional state tax credit uh, to help people purchase electric vehicles. Um, we know there's massive benefits, especially for Metro Denver air quality. Uh, and I think it's a, a really um, a great uh, policy addition that we did a couple of years ago at the state level to keep that going. And so the federal and the state incentives, plus a lot of work on new charging infrastructure should give the customers, uh, you know, the consumers huge amount of choice and make it very easy to make the switch. So that's what we're trying to do. And I think Colorado, again, is among the top two or three states when it comes to this, California, Oregon, Washington uh, are also leaders. Um, and we'll, we'll keep trying to push that position in Colorado. And, and I would just say the other thing that I worked on was to push back against the car dealers uh, to allow direct sales to customers. And so manufacturers that don't have dealer networks that want to sell directly to customers, we now allow that. That I think is going to really help to open up the market and create very dynamic uh, choices for the customer. Thank you. Um, Tom's question, what responsibility do you feel that the state has for people experiencing homelessness? It seems the state has limited involvement in this issue. Yeah, I, I mean, I think that we put a lot of responsibility for that on county and local governments, but I will say the state does provide significant help to the local governments uh, to work on, on um, people experiencing homelessness or, or lack of, of housing availability. We have about $100 million a year at the state level that we spend to support for affordable housing. There are state bonding instruments that are available for, for those developments. Uh, a lot of that trickles down to tax credits at the local level. Um, so I think the state is in one of the uh, support position and really trying to empower local governments to go further and faster on this. You see how that plays out in Denver. Uh, I think we've had some successes, but it's certainly uh, well below where we need to be. 
Um, and, and my hope is that that's something that we can double down on in the next year's budget and the budget after that, uh, because it's just a massive need and trying to help the, you know, the cities and the counties do more, uh, more quickly. Um, I think, you know, we've, we did add $50 million last year uh, to the state affordable housing fund. And I think we're also trying to give local governments more zoning latitude uh, to do uh, more affordable housing planning. And all of those things I think will help help over time. Uh, good, you know, I think we all wish there was a, kind of a, a silver bullet here or a magic uh, arrow or whatever metaphor we wanna use. I'm trying hard not to use gun metaphors, surprisingly hard not to use uh, firearm metaphors sometimes. Uh, so I'm gonna stop saying silver bullet. Uh, let me know if you've got a good replacement for me. But you know, we're, we are trying at the state to be very supportive of, of local action. Great. We have um, two more questions in the chat if we um, have time for it. One is kind of just a follow up from the discussion of the oil and gas industry earlier um, in regards to the media influenced by the oil and gas industry is disproportionate to their actual economic impact except in Weld County, is that so? Um, and then a second question from Diana regarding what Colorado is doing to protect our Asian um, brothers and sisters. Yeah, I, well, I'll see, I'll again, try to do those both quickly. Uh, both deserve some time, but, um, you know, I think there is obviously a corporate influence in our media. Um, you know, the, just think about who owns the biggest newspapers in the state. Uh, and you know, follow the breadcrumbs or follow the money, as they say. Uh, and I'll, I'll let folks look into that themselves. Uh, there's no doubt there's influence there. I think we'd be kidding ourselves if we didn't come to that conclusion. Um, but I, I think it's changed a lot. Uh, we are in a, I think, a, a, a place where there is a little more parity than there was on this issue. And I think because of what I was talking about before, as far as uh, you know, the the state dependency on some of these industries is very low. Um, you know, I think Colorado has been able to be a leader in, in uh, assertive and uh, appropriate regulation for, for upstream oil and gas in particular. So I think we've been, a, you know, again, a, a leading light when it comes to many of those issues, with the, especially with the passage of Senate Bill 181 from 2019. Um, and what was the second question? Oh, I, I can say it. I can say Great. it. So, um, you know, our son lives in China and we have a daughter-in-law mm -hmm. and a grandson of now Chinese descent. And um, I have to say, I'm worried about them visiting. And, and Jorge, feel, you can unmute yourself and feel to jump in at any time. But I, I really, um, it, would, it would hurt me anyway. But knowing that my, my daughter-in-law and my son and my grandson may be visiting, it scares me to death about having the kind of innocence be hurt so deeply. So what, what do you know that is going on around our state regarding that issue? Yeah, I mean, I would say you've, you've heard a lot of, uh, I think, statements from public officials. I, I put out one myself last week. Um, I think you've seen the governor be active on this. I think ADL and some of those related uh, organizations and nonprofits have done some great work on this. And, I, and some of you may know, my, my wife's family is South Asian. Um, and uh, I realize a lot of this uh, hate is, is being uh, focused on the East Asian community, but this is something that, that affects me at home as well. Uh, as I talk to my two boys about what it means to be mixed race, uh, mixed, mixed ethnicity, being half uh, Asian uh, in, in their lineage. Um, this is something we talk a lot about at home and it's not something somewhere else, it's here. It is uh, unfortunately something we're dealing with in Colorado, in Denver. Um, we've got to stand up for our Asian brothers and sisters uh, and, and, and other uh, ways that this hate is, is demonstrated. Every time we've got to speak up. Uh, and so I, I know many of you do that. I, ho I hope we'll all continue to do that uh, and call it out for what it is, uh, hatred and bigotry. And, and stand up and, and fight back with everything we've got. Uh, it's not the place I wanna raise my kids. It's not the place we wanna live. Um, and we've gotta be vocal. And that's, that's, how you, that's how we put an end to it. So, so that, it's a group. Go ahead. Oh, oh, I was just gonna pass it off to my friend Jorge because I, I know he's been doing some great work on, on some related issues and perhaps this one directly. And I'm so excited to hear from him today. Thank you, Senator. And I actually live in, uh... 
in uh, your district, as you know that. Uh, I live in Southeast Denver. Um, I'm the lead organizer for Coloradans for the Common Good. For um, I think I know, recognize a lot of names uh, in the group, but uh, thank you all for uh, having me. Uh, Coloradans for the Common Good, in case you haven't uh, uh, heard, is a broad-based organization of congregations civic groups, unions, et cetera, that come together with the explicit purpose to build power and change the way things are, or sometimes prevent changes, whatever the case may be. It's a fairly new organization in, in Colorado, although we've been doing this work, I've been doing this work for over 16 years. Uh, before coming to Colorado, I was in San Antonio, Texas, and part of that in Arizona. Uh, and you know, Diana, the, your question about how we're how we're right now, what are we doing to protect uh, Asian Americans or or Asian immigrants uh, or visitors? It's you know, it's a question that that has been asked forever in this country. So, what are we doing to not offend Mexicans? What about African Americans? What about the Irish? I mean, you keep going back, and you'll find a group that we were happy to offend and scapegoat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and it's something every, in every occasion, the answer is that we cannot legislate that, that we cannot police that as much as some people have tried to use the police for everything. That's something that we cannot do. We cannot legislate for. Um, one of the things that I found most uh, compelling when it comes to how we deal with racist attitudes uh, comes from uh, this book that I, I bet many of you have read, Stamped from the Beginning by Ibram Kendi. Um, and, and he says, you know, racist attitudes do not start in people's hearts and minds. They didn't start there in this country. They came out of people's, some people's uh, economic interest, that they wanted to protect their economic, they wanted to advance their economic interest and they needed in this country, blacks to do the work for them. And so it became their interest to create this myth of how they were inferior to us. And then they came up with ideas and racist ideas that over time became part of our mythology and eventually became ingrained in our hearts and minds. But he says, if you wanna change racist ideas, I wouldn't start by trying to change hearts and minds. I would, I would try to, but I would start by trying to change the balance of power because that's where it started. A particularly economic interest and hearts and minds will follow. And frankly, this is my editorializing. And if they don't, then it won't matter as much because as long as those who were discriminated against have enough power, particularly economic power, then you know they'll do whatever they wanna do. They're not gonna need the rest of us hearts and minds to do it. Uh, they're gonna have enough power to change the rules and the policies and the laws to also protect them. Uh, so, you know, from, from an organizer's perspective, what we can do uh, to protect not only Asian Americans, but, but Latinos and African Americans, et cetera, is to work with them side by side to make sure that they are part of this building power, building the base so that they, they can also be part of defending themselves so that we're not, they're not depending on us to defend them and protect them. Uh, it's more about joining in the work. And it's always important to do it now instead of waiting for the crisis to erupt, right? When the crisis is here, we're all scrambling to figure out who's being hurt and how can we protect them as opposed to, we're already in relationship with them. We already know and they, are, they know us, et cetera. So anyway, that was my, my reaction to your question, Diana. Thank you, thank you. Do other people have um, questions they'd like to present for discussion or talk about any of the other things that we've already covered in terms of voting rights, et cetera, et cetera. Deb, Deb Bullock, go ahead and unmute. Hi, yeah, as, so part of giving them economic power, 
doesn't that start with giving them the right education, giving their children the correct education so they can move ahead? Um, so I, I can I can take a crack out of that. Um, I would say that it is a it is a very important piece. Deb, I would say that education is certainly a very important piece. But when, whenever we talk about power, I think it's, we, we like to, to make clear that, I like to start with a basic definition. Power is the ability to act, right? From the Latin roots of, of power is the ability to act. And, and, and those of us who grew up speaking Spanish, uh, are able, it's easier for us to connect on that because in Spanish power, poder, it's as much a verb as it is a noun. And whereas in English speaking countries, you kind of get stuck with the idea of power because it's usually a noun and it comes loaded with all kinds of ideas. Of power is good, power is bad, et cetera. But simply the ability to act, right? Am I able to protect my family? Am I able to have a house to live in? Am I able to provide for my kids? That is power and in, in, in most political, Sociologists would define that as a beginning with two or more people with a plan of action, right? Do we have people coming together with a plan, moving towards a goal? That's the beginning of power. If we have a good education, we'll have a better sense for why we need to build power uh, or how to go about it. But listen, when I was organizing in Arizona, it was the height of the anti-immigrant legislations getting passed through in that state. Prop 200, Prop 300, Prop, et cetera. Sheriff Joe Arpaio was chasing immigrants. The Sheriff Joe Arpaio set up a big uh, checkpoint in front of Catholic churches on Good Friday because he knew where those immigrants were going and he picked up a whole bunch of them. Now, that was fine by a lot of people in Arizona. And this attorney, a good friend of ours said, you know, we ought to do a celebration because we've been raising money to send uh, Latinos and Latinas to college and we're graduating in record numbers, so it's great. And I said, Tommy, what's, you know, that, that ought to be celebrated, but the more Latinos we get graduated from college, the more we get up, we get beat up at the legislature and by the sheriff of Bayou. So what gives? We're getting better education and we have less and less power every year. That's really frustrating to me, what's going on? And it got thinking that, yes, education is great, but does not immediately translate to power. It is not automatic. It never has, never will be, right? So we gotta be able to distinguish it too. Yes, we need good education. Yes, we need good jobs. Yeah, we need good housing. But none of that is give, give us power automatically. That's something you gotta build intentionally. Yeah, I just should say quickly, I love that answer. And it, and it reminds me of a, a phrase from economics, necessary, but not sufficient. That is a necessary, but not sufficient condition. And I, I would love how you, how you talked about that, Jorge. Well, thank you. That's, that's much more succinct. I wish <laughs> I should get a comment for that. <laughs> Jorge, yeah. are you, um, are you then seeing organizing for undocumented laborers? And in your experience, how uh, is there a way of some kind of reconciliation between people who may be in unions here already and may feel that uh, cheap, let us say cheap Mexican labor is threatening them how that just seems like such a problematic area. So I don't expect some big solution, but I'd love to hear your wisdom on it. Well, I can tell you what I've, what I've learned over the years, Mary. I think you're, you're right that there's been tension between labor and pro-immigrant uh, mm -hmm. movements. I mean, the farm workers, right? The whole very progressive movement uh, spearheaded by Cesar Chavez for a long time, they were against yeah. uh, immigration bills. They opposed them because that was direct competition. Yeah. Um, most unions now, not, not all I'm sure, but most unions now have come to recognize, and this is because of a lot of 
studies that have been done that recent immigrants, very recent immigrants tend to compete with other recent immigrants who came right before them. Usually they don't represent any threat at the labor force for anybody, let's say with a high school education who's from here. If you don't have a high school education, then you have reasons to be threatened by competition coming from abroad. But by and large, most workers um, are not threatened by that. Again, the recent immigrants, and this has been done, uh, shown by study after study, recent immigrants tend to be a threat to the immigrants who came right before them. Uh, and most unions now are not dealing with them as members, All right? Most unions have uh, as their members, people who have been trained, who are become some sort of experts in their field. And so at least a big, bigger labor has now come in support of uh, more lenient immigration bills, I would say. Uh, even though they're very much in their history to oppose them, I think most of them are supportive. Okay. Um, before we, we go on, I know that Chris, you're still planning to have identified it in our piece, what we do. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I guess I, I, I suppose to, to prevent myself from becoming cynical at times or feeling downtrodden in moments when the, the battle seems long and mm -hmm. um, and when, when the odds seem long. Um, I really, I guess, have tried to think of this as, as we're all in this relay race together, uh, each of us grabbing the baton um, and, and taking the pieces that we can run with and pushing them along. And um, that kind of helps me, you know, jump out of bed each morning to, to go uh, tackle the next puzzle. And and so I think, you know, the, I just have really valued the chance to interact with, with Chum, with the group that you've put together here, because it, I think it helps uh, tether me to uh, some of those foundational moral elements that drive this work, that help us uh, recharge, uh, even when we have a loss, even when we have a setback. Um, and I, and I, so I think, you know, this idea of reclaiming, uh, and, that, and the word that you've used to set up this meeting, I think resonates with me for that reason and, and, and trying to reclaim, um, you know, the moral imperative around our work, reclaim some of the words that have gotten, uh, uh, can have gotten, um, misconstrued, uh, misused, um, abused in some cases. I mean, that is, that is part of this work and, um, I, I have a tendency sometimes to get so uh, down in the weeds or in, you know, into a spreadsheet about a certain topic or think about, you know, what is the, uh, the Colorado, you know, the distributional effects of different tax policies and like all the stuff we've got to do to, to figure out policy. Um, but, but let us, let us stay tethered to that, the, the moral imperative of our work. And so I just want to say thanks for having me today. I find it really recharging and refreshing uh, to, to hear the questions, to have this dialogue, to hear from Jorge, um, and, and to hear, you know, about some of the latest work that you all are doing together. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to have to leave here in just a minute to, to go back into those budget negotiations. Um, you know, we're just to give you a flavor of what, like today, we are trying to figure out the best way to increase access to higher education for low-income students in the state. Uh, so that, you know, that is immediately, as soon as I hang up with you, that is immediately where we're gonna go turn to. What is the most cost-effective way to do that? How do we get the most, you know, bang for the buck, so to speak, with limited state dollars? Um, I mean, these are the, the proximate questions that sit inside this larger moral framework, which we're all trying to bring uh, to the work that we do. And, and so I'm just, I'm grateful to have this time with you uh, and, and just really appreciate the invitation. And, and Chris, thank you for being here and taking the time to be with us. Um, you know, everyone that's on the screen, and I know most of them, are people that really do what you're saying, do their piece to make a difference. And we, we need to support you to do your piece to make a difference. Um, and we need you to lead. We need your voice to be there and heard and loud and however you do it. And so then you need to tell us how we can help you and support you to do what you need to do. 
We need your voice. It's really critical and really important. Thank you for that reminder and uh, uh, spurring me on. I very much appreciate it. We will do that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being on All with right. us, Chris. And then Jorge. Thank you. Thank you, Jesse. Um, so, um, Jorge, um, looking at there, there's so many issues here, and I think uh, I know that uh, many of us are working from that perspective of trying to do things nonviolently. We've been we've been studying, we've been participating. Um, we we want to learn better how to engage. You know, when you talked about Apio and doing what he did in front of the churches on, you know, Good Friday. It just is, what do we do? How do we do this? And how do we keep our um, selves going? Because it, th these last years have been, not that this is new, it just was in our faces in such a big way. Mm. So what, what, how can you help us? Oh, well, that's... Give us words of wisdom. That's a, that's a, pretty, that's a pretty broad question uh, yes, but is. you know I, let me just because i'm i'm reading this today um i'm reading a book by two economists uh the book is called the narrow corridor and i'm not gonna i'm not gonna bore you with all the details but i'm finding it interesting because he's talking about the power of the state and he's using he's using different examples in our history in different countries of how Ideally, you want a balance between the power of the state so that it can accomplish things. I mean, we want the state powerful enough to have to invest in higher education, for example, so that more of our population learns how to read and write, so that their job, so that we can do trading with others, so that we can be protected from foreign invaders, whatever the case may be, we want a strong state. But that's got to be balanced with uh, power in the people so that the state does not become despotic, right? And there are countries who are in different places. There are, there are countries where the local communities, towns, tribes, or whatever the case may be, want to be so independent. They don't want to be told what to do. Nobody can make them do anything. And, and so the country has all of that. So the, the people have a lot of power and the state is weak because of that. We have a lot of examples in Africa where there's a strong tribal cultures, but as a state, they're not able to make progress. This, these authors are arguing that the United States is one of those examples that it set itself up to have a strong state but also was rooted in local communities being involved and organized to have power. Now I haven't finished the book, so I'm not sure where, where they're going with it, but if my perception, my experience that we're not keeping up that balance, that we're, that I put myself on the side of not the state, but you know, the people, I'm not part of the, the deep state or anything like that. And I imagine that most of you are on this, would put yourselves on the same side. So I would say that we are losing, we're falling behind in our ability to keep the state in check. And I would even dare say, even though we all like Senator Hansen, he's been a great ally of ours, that we wanna keep him in check too. <laughs> and we wanna keep the governor in check. We wanna keep the mayor in check. We wanna keep especially you want to keep those who are always whispering in their ears. And we know who they are. They are usually corporations, organized money. They, you know, the kind of the elite, they, they seem to be winning the game, right? If there, if there, <laughs> maybe you shouldn't call it a game, but if there is a race, if there is a balance in the ideal situation where the state, the power, the elite have the power to advance the country and economic development. We gotta have enough power to keep that in check as well. 
otherwise they do whatever they want, it becomes abusive, it becomes despotic, it becomes a tyrant, you, whatever the case may be. And so I, I'm really stirred up by that argument. And it makes sense to me as an organizer that what we can do is not just elect the right people. And right? sometimes the tendency, so we, if we were just to find the right guy to be president or gal, if we were to find the right person to be governor, then everything would be fine. And then we just kind of sit back. In my experience, that never works. I mean, there are some better than others to be sure. We're, we're seeing that, right? There's some elected officials that are better than others, for sure. However, I think the best thing we can do is to keep organizing ourselves and people like us and people that we could be allies with so that we have power to keep that structure in check and whoever we elect in check friend or foe we got to keep them in check and i mean i believe i believe in the market i believe there should be a market but i think that the market ideology has taken over everything i mean it's become a religion uh, you can't question everything because, oh, well, what is the market going to say? Well, I don't know. What does the gospel say? Right? Why aren't we asking that question? Um, and so I, that's, that's kind of the, the, where I come from as an organizer is that we got to do more of, of organizing us to be a powerful, strong base that can then not only change policies when needed, but also change the narrative. Uh, of, I mean, to your point about what do we what do we think about Asian Americans? Well, you know, our our institutions talking about it, our our churches talking about it. Um, are we preaching about it? Are we making sure that we're all, you know, that, that that's an important. I was uh, when I first moved to Colorado about three years ago. I was visiting with a congregation. Uh, which will go unnamed because it's in your neighborhood. And somebody there told me, we're not allowed to talk about the environment here. Because anytime we start talking about the environment, somebody says, well, you know, part of the problem is oil and gas. Inevitably, somebody will say that. Because, you know, I don't know, because you see all the oil and gas going on and the contamination. And then they say the next step is, well, we, should we do something about it? And then the people who come from oil and gas in this congregation will just, you know, walk away. So we just don't bring up the environment. And, you know, I'm not saying, I'm not saying don't, don't worry about those people, let them walk away. After all, if you're a congregation, everybody is in your congregation. But we ought to be dealing with those tough subjects. Um, I, uh, I was talking, we, we had a presentation by this, uh, by this African American pastor from uh, Brooklyn one time. And he said that the biggest sin of the church is that we had to lower our voices so we can raise our budgets. And boy, that hurts, man. <laughs> I'm, I'm born and raised Catholic myself. And I mean, I look around and I'm like, when are we going to say something about something? Jesus. Uh -huh. um, you know, let alone organize people, at least say something. So that's something we, we could start doing. Right? Well, I know that not well, everybody here is from a congregation, but anyway. Oh, but, okay. um, I, I don't know how many people saw the interview with Harry and Megan. The thing that I walked away with was the shock of, of them talking about the firm. You know, I kept saying to my husband, but she's the queen. <laughs> and my husband said, and he's the Pope. Yeah. And it's that kind of thing where we have our institutions, our corporations that have the power over the individual. And we end up with a fear. We think our leaders can speak out. And we look at our campaigns. We look at the parties. Um, right now, I, I focus on the Republican Party and look like everyone is in this lock and step with even people that may have some conscience that are not willing to go against the firm. And so that's a very big um, 
it's a very big, powerful organization to do what you're saying. I'm not saying you're wrong. You're right. But it's we get we get caught. We get caught in the fear or caught in feeling paralyzed and not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. I'm curious as to uh, the group here. How, how many of you have either have had experience in doing community organizing or, or perhaps presently do it? And uh, you know, whether you have any questions about that or challenges with that or. And you can all go off, uh, you know, if you have a question, just go off mute and ask, just be part of the conversation. Anybody? Well, yes, I, I guess I'd like to ask Jorge, I'm Peggy Albert Nims. I'd like to ask him what specific ways is he suggesting we keep you know, even the wonderful Chris Hansen and, and his colleagues in check. I mean, how, how would you suggest we, I mean, there are a thousand bills we could track. Uh, so which ones are you working on? Is there a particular orientation around, I don't know, criminal justice, uh, uh, environmental justice uh, that you're working on that Colorado? Because yeah. I went to one of your very, very early meetings up at, um, where was that at a high school somewhere? Uh, Phil Weiser was there. Man Manual High School. Yes, I think it was at Manual. Yeah. yeah, and that, and I haven't really heard of you, your organization, since then. And so, uh, as far as being an active involvement in some particular part of the sectors, so yeah. I'd yeah. love to know where you're putting your energies more specifically. Yeah, Peggy, are you with uh, Peggy, right? Yes. Are, are you with? Uh with an organization or a congregation? Yeah, First Unitarian of- uh, First Unitarian. Yeah, of, uh, yeah. Right here in you know, Lafayette and 14th and Lafayette. Yeah, so you were at the, our founding convention, right? That was our official- Yes. Mm -hmm. Coming out party. Yes, and uh, it was quite a party too. <laughs> Before yeah. COVID, it was great, a great event. Yeah, well, let me let me answer the, the first question uh, about how do, how do we hold uh, people accountable and in check? And then, and then the, the next part, which is what issues we're working on. What I, what I typically mean by um, the way we can keep them in check is to make sure that we have um, enough people organized in such a way that they need to deal with us. Uh, we organize in a nonpartisan way. We never endorse a candidate or a party. Right? That's that's just us. I know that not every organization is that way, but and we do that because we want to make sure that we attract people from different po political leanings or no political leanings initially, and we want to make sure that once elected, no matter what party they come from, that we have a way to talk to them. Unfortunately, what happens is that if you endorse somebody and your your candidate loses, you're you're out of luck for the next two years or four years or whatever the term might be. And so it's important for us to hold all of them accountable. And you saw a little bit of that when you came to that assembly because we have candidates for school board. Yes. And yeah, then we asked them to all to respond to our agenda, that agenda which was shaped by hearing from people. We engage in conversations with hundreds of people before that assembly, 500 came out, but we talked to a lot more so that we can have an agenda and we could ask candidates for school board, if elected, will you support A, B, C, and D, whatever the questions were. And then we make sure that all of the people that we talk to know where those candidates stand, right? So no matter who wins, if they said that we're gonna do that public, and if they said, no, they don't support it. We also let our people know. Uh, we don't tell them how to vote, but we need to do, we need to go vote in an educator fashion. So that's, that's an important part of our organizing work. Um, and the more people we have in that network, the more the, those candidates and elected officials will pay attention to you. Uh, clearly we did not have enough to attract, say the governor to that assembly, right? But we did have the attorney general. And so there's always need to do more. We've been working, uh, Peggy, on a number of things since the pandemic started. The very first thing we did actually was when we were wondering whether you could in fact organize in a pandemic, 
we heard that the grocery store workers were not included in the very first executive action that the governor issued to protect frontline workers and to give them emergency uh, paid leave so they can go see the doctor if they had symptoms. They passed, he issued that executive order, they put it in place and they included a whole bunch of people but not grocery store workers. And then we read about that and we were surprised. And then we read that the union asked the governor to include them. And then the next week we heard that call again by the workers and then by the third week, we were like, well, wait a minute. Right now, we're all saying that grocery store workers are our heroes. And we all love them for working and keeping us fed, but we're not protecting them. That doesn't make sense. So we got a letter signed by like 20 clergy, sent it to the governor's office and asked for a meeting with him. And to our big surprise, we got a call back saying the governor wants to meet with you this afternoon talk about this. We never had a meeting or a conversation with the governor, but in the middle of this crisis, we did. And so we invited the union to come along and we made a case and he said, well, of course they should be included. That was a mistake. Department of Labor didn't include that starting tomorrow. And then they send us the revised uh, policy. That added 20,000 workers to that protection, which included free childcare until for like three months. A week later, there was the outbreak of COVID at the meat packing plant in, in Greeley. So we went back to the governor and the Colorado Department of Labor and said, well, what about meat packing workers? Are they not essential? So they met with us again and they added 30,000 food and beverage processing workers in Colorado. Uh, you know, just, I had no idea that you could do something like that, but it's just a matter of pulling people together, making the case and taking chances uh, we've been working on expanding internet access. We got Comcast to change their online application so that people could apply for their affordable program without using a social security number. Because we'd heard from uh, counselors and teachers that it was mostly kids from immigrant families who were not able to connect. And it was not easy to get a meeting with Comcast. Comcast is one of those big, powerful, companies that nobody likes. Uh, it's Xfinity, they branded Xfinity here. But we finally got a meeting. In fact, the governor helped us get the meeting with them. And it took him like a month, but they came back with an answer saying they were gonna change their online application nationwide to make it optional to use social security number. They could use a number of other IDs, including the kids student ID. And so, you know, we've been, we've been really busy right now. We have a number of priorities in the legislature that includes renters' rights, farm workers' rights, uh, auditing the school accountability system, et cetera. So it's been a really busy year, Peggy. I mean, I, uh, we should reach out and, and, and let you all know what we're doing because I need to get that you haven't heard. Here. I need to get back on your uh, network. Maybe yeah, you can yeah. tell everybody in the group how to get in touch with uh, uh, and get on your newsletter or your email blasts or whatever you, how you inform people. Well, actually, yeah. I think I have that in the piece I sent out. Great. Um, I'll, I'll Colorado's, for the, Colorado's for the common good. So yeah, you can go to our website and just sign up to get updates. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you very much. That sounds like you've had a lot of good success over the COVID yeah. period. It's, Thanks, Jorge. It's been Jorge. an interesting year, yeah. So we and have about 15 minutes left and um, other people have other questions, comments, thoughts. I'm surprised. This is usually a talkative group. Well, uh, Senator Hansen must, must have answered all the questions. So that's, that's very good. <laughs> Jim, you have not a question to ask? Jim Laurie. <laughs> well, I do have another. If you will let me go on, then. Oh, thank God you're here. <laughs> oh, Jim, is Jim is Jim known uh, I, for never being out of a question, or what's, what's going no. on? I'm uh, I'm getting uh, uh, watching a lot of ads, very anti-discriminatory ads on television against the public option for health care hmm. here in the state. 
-huh. And this morning on the radio, I heard on CPR a pretty extensive description of what it is, which seems so innocuous. It's giving the companies two years to figure out how to do cheaper insurance plans. And then only then does the state come in with a public option. But this campaign is brutal already. And uh, so I'm wondering, are, are you doing anything about, you know, healthcare access and public options? And uh, is that outside the realm of your particular initiatives right now? Um, we haven't done much about that, Peggy. And it's, and it's not because we're not interested. It's, it's just a matter of capacity at this point. Sure. Uh, but uh, it is very much along the lines of, of, our, of our values and interests in supporting a strong public sector um, that, can, that can do things like uh, uh, paid leave, which you know, passed in the, in the ballot last, last go around. I think that this is kind of along the same lines and, and we very much support it. I think what you're seeing is and let's face it, both, I mean, all sides do that, you know, right and left tend to kind of exaggerate and sometimes in their attacks of the other. But in this case, it kind of reminds me, I don't know where you all stand and if you even talked about the school accountability system, but the current system in Colorado that includes standardized testing, but also what do you do when school doesn't meet a certain goal? We're supporting a bill that would audit the system. <laughs> wouldn't change it. It would not uh, even recommend any changes yet. It would simply audit the whole thing. And a lot of people that we work with feel strongly that it should be audited because they found that it is mostly schools that serve minority and low income kids that get identified as failing. And then they, there's all these interventions that tend to be punitive in nature. Many schools have been closed. Some schools have been turned over to a private management company. Some had turned into charters, et cetera. So they felt that. Well, we're supporting this because he would audit it. And we believe that this audit ought to point out whether the system has any biases uh, in the way that it determines whether a school needs an intervention or not. And those who oppose it, Peggy, are just like, oh my God, how dare you even question this system? I mean, imagine that it could have a bias. How dare you say that the people who created would build in bias? And like, well, we're not saying that it definitely has. We're saying that there is the possibility that it may be biased because the outcome is like, and I told them, listen, look at the criminal justice system. Every, every, if I ask anybody in the criminal justice system, they tell me that they're not racist and they're not biased. And that may be so. Judges are not biased. Prosecutors are not biased. Police officers are not biased. And like, like you, you look at the jails and prisons and what, who do you find there? Well, black and brown men and now more and more black and brown women. And so, it makes you wonder, no? Is there something in the system that's biased? Uh, and so I would say the same thing about housing, wages, jobs, educational systems. They all, we need to question that and take a hard look. But the reaction has been so over the top in, in part because when people kind of want to protect something, uh, any little question, they see it as an opening for them bigger questions. And I think that that's what you're seeing. What you're hearing is that you're beginning, even if it's kind of innocuous, like you said, it's a questioning. It's an opening that's something they want to protect. Is there a bill that you're supporting or that we can go research? Because, you know, that opening event you had on the teachers and getting the school board candidates to say where they stood on those seven or eight policies, that was powerful. So... Yeah, we, we will send you. We will send you the bill number. It's it's actually being uh, what um, redrafted after a number of meetings, and so it's not until the moment that it's introduced that it gets a number. Right. So, so it's so it coming has been soon. So I'll share it with you all. 
Thank you. You'll get it to Deanna. Yes. Perfect. Uh, Jim is asking uh, something about how we started in Colorado and where the support comes from. Uh, Jim, we have 26 member institutions now from uh, congregations, unions, and civic groups. And they all contribute with uh, membership dues. And so Colorado's for the Common Good, like most organizations affiliated with the IAF, about 60 around the country, our goal is to build a budget that primarily relies on our own members do so that we can be independent um, and, and responsive to our members and not to foundations here and there. We still seek grants like other nonprofits and we've gotten grants in the past. We had uh, a benefactor in the first couple of years who put in some seed money to get started about four years ago. But of course that was just the first couple of years. So now we are, uh, raising money locally and getting the, the membership dues. Uh, we were invited to come and organize here from people who had seen or been part of other organizations in other states. But uh, like I said, we're very new in Colorado and we're also, uh, we also started an organization in the Western Slope uh, in um, Glenwood Springs and Carbondale in that area. Um, Mary, to your question about Suncor, you know, we did, we did a number of meetings, uh, because we're, we're organizing Commerce City, um, but we haven't, uh, done much with, uh, uh, the recent developments there. I know that they were found responsible for some and they're made to pay, put money into a fund. Uh, if you are all interested, we're, you know, we've been asked whether there's something we could do, uh, we, we don't want to get in the way of the very local leaders there who are, who are spearheading that. I met with, uh, with Lucy and a couple other the women there, and we're kind of staying on the sidelines waiting for them to see if, if they want us to get involved. We'd love to because it's, it's kind of a shame the way that they rain chemicals on that community. It's pretty, pretty scary. Uh, I think that's the questions, right? Yep. Any, any so is there anything else you'd like to uh, close us out with, Jorge? Um, I appreciate you taking the time to be with us and having this discussion and know more about uh, Common Good. I think one of the questions I would have is, um, I know there are a lot of different organizations sort of similar. And is there a, a reason that people don't come together as one organization? Oh, I'd like to know that. Uh, I'd like to know why we have so many denominations too, but you know, that's a question that's going to take us a, mm -hmm. a lot longer. Um, but uh, I, you know, there are, there are a lot of organizations and I think we do things similarly, but maybe slightly different. Uh, I hope that we can be better at collaborating. We're not, and I'm, I'm the first to admit, we're not always very good at collaborating, uh, even though we may be on the same side, so to speak. Um, I would say that to, to close, um, I, I, I would just invite you to come check out what we're up to. If you're part of an organization, um, a congregation or, or not, and wanna learn about what uh, organized people can do and uh, through an organization like this we we need to grow we certainly don't have the membership that we need to make the the changes we got to make we want to grow up and down the front range so if you have ideas and suggestions on who to talk to in El Paso County in Pueblo and Weld and Larimer we you know we got to build uh, outside uh, I was recently talking to a group who's uh, spearheading this renter's rights initiative. And I asked, well, who's supporting it? He gave me a list of like 10 organizations. I said, oh, well, you guys, it's good, right? I mean, you're covered. They said, well, we need help with meeting with this senator in Jefferson County. We need to meet with the senator down in Colorado Springs and then one in, in Fort Collins. 
and so it struck me that how much of the organizing or community work is done in Denver. Right? And it's not so much uh -huh. beyond that. And so they knew that we have members in Jefferson County. So we already had a meeting with that senator. And, but we need to grow beyond Denver in order to be more helpful in Denver. You know what I mean? It's just like all this part of Colorado that needs to be organized and brought in because a lot of legislators like Senator Hansen are already on board and Gonzalez and Rodriguez and Gonzalez Gutierrez. I mean, they're all really good, but then they're limited by why their colleagues can do who are outside of Denver. So any, any connections, whether you're interested in participating or any suggestions on who we should reach out to because you have relationships outside of Denver, uh, any of that would be, would be welcome. And, uh, and you can reach us through that through that uh, website, or I'm going to put my my email, which is uh, very easy. Thank you. Thank it's you. Jorge at clcommongood.org. Thank you, Jorge. Um, if anyone, I will close out unless someone has a comment that they would like to make before we go. Okay. Well, I thank you, Jorge, very much for being part of this. And if there are issues that you are a specific issue that there's a lot of passion around it that you would like to share with us contact me and we will we can do this again Very good. I, I have to tell you i know we we miss seeing each other face to face but this this is good you get end up end up with more people that get to participate than you usually do have yeah so this is great thank you all for having me i appreciate yes. the invitation nice to meet you all right